Gospel of Luke, Chapter 22 Summary of Chapter 22 Satan enters Judas, who agrees to betray Jesus to the authorities in return for money. Here we have a brief description of the preparation and events of the Last Supper and the institution of communion that comes from it. During the supper, a dispute breaks out again between the disciples about who would be greatest between them, and Jesus prophesies Peter's denial. They move out to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, before being betrayed by the kiss and then arrested. A disciple cuts off the ear of a servant of the priest, and Jesus immediately heals that servant. Jesus is taken to the house of the high priest, where Peter, in fear of his own safety, denies even knowing Jesus. This is what Jesus had prophesied during the supper earlier on. Jesus is mocked and abused by his guards before being taken before the Sanhedrin at daybreak. He is then questioned about his origin, and Jesus confirms he is the Son of God, which the priests hold as proof of his blasphemy. New Major Section Luke chapter 22 verse 1 to Luke chapter 23 verse 56 The Suffering and Death of Jesus as the time of Jesus' death draws near, Luke's focus shifts from the temple to the broader city of Jerusalem, and from the teachings of Jesus to increasingly fast-moving events. New section, Luke chapter 22 verses 1 to 38, The Plot to Kill Jesus and the Passover Meal As Jesus has his last meal with his disciples, he once again discusses with them his approaching death. Meanwhile, plans are set in motion against him. New subsection, Luke chapter 22 verses 1 to 6, Judas agrees to betray Jesus. As the people gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, some of their leaders plotted in secret to kill Jesus. In reality, it was Satan who attempted the downfall of Jesus at this time, but he only succeeded in helping to provide the only solution to eternal salvation. That Jesus was betrayed by a supposed friend indicates some of the dangers to his church that may lie within, rather than it only being external attacks that are of consequence. Satan will attempt to gain control of believers in order to attack the church through any means. Verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called the Passover, was approaching. The Feast of Unleavened Bread spanned this and 15 to 21, the first month of the Jewish calendar i.e. March to April, and its observance is a requirement of Jewish law as stated in Leviticus 23 verses 5 to 6. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. Preparations for this Passover were made on Thursday afternoon, Nisan 14. Jesus and the disciples ate the Passover meal after sundown on Thursday evening, now Nisan 15, with Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper during the evening. Jesus was crucified the following day, i.e. Friday, which was still Nisan 15. The first day of unleavened bread could refer either to Nisan 14 or Nisan 15, according to Jewish reckoning in the New Testament era, and Passover lambs were apparently killed on both days but the Gospels refer to Thursday Nisan 14 for the preparation of the Last Supper. That same evening, which was Nisan 15, as the Jewish day starts at sunset, was the time they ate the Last Supper. The Passover lamb had to be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. Preparations for the meal had to be made inconspicuously, as Jesus is already a marked target. There were many feasts of the Lord, appointed by the ceremonial law. In particular, there were three feasts that God had commanded that all men must attend. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which commences with the Passover, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, which signifies God caring for his people in the desert. But the Passover was considered the most important of them all. It began all the feasts on the night when the angel of death passed over the house of Israel, but killed all the firstborn of Egypt, and prompted the captives' release from enslavement in that land. It concluded all the feasts on the night when the Christ was betrayed. Passover was the opening day feast, which was then followed by the seven-day feast of unleavened bread, making it an eight-day feast in total. It started and finished with a holy convocation, and would usually have a further Sabbath congregation as well. Verse 2 And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. 
As stated on other occasions, the chief priests were not the high priests, but senior members of the extended family group. They were no doubt members of the Sanhedrin and were probably Sadducees. Teachers of the law were also called scribes as previously discussed. Looking for some way shows that their verdict about Jesus is already decided. Whether through their own determination to be rid of him, or because God had hardened their hearts, we cannot tell. The only remaining issue is how to get rid of him. This comes as no surprise to us, for we have already noted. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Luke chapter 19 verses 47 to 48 They were afraid of the people because many had started to believe in Jesus and were starting to question what was being taught to them by their religious leaders. Verse 3 Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. Judas called Iscariot had never truly believed in Jesus and Jesus was aware of this, probably since before the creation of the world. Although Peter was referring to Jesus in the following passage, its sentiment can probably be applied to all people in God's divine plan. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. 1 Peter 1 verse 20 We see this in, Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe, and who would betray him. John chapter 6 verse 64 And Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. John chapter 6, verses 70 to 71. Although apparently none of his other disciples realized it, as Judas was still part of their group and his outward behavior apparently did not give him away, Judas' pattern of dishonest behavior was evidence of his unbelief, for, as John 12, verse 6 puts it, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. This is not the action of a true believer. But here, with the consent of his sinful heart, Satan entered into him, and thereby he exercises much greater influence over his actions, prompting him to go to the chief priests with a plot. Verse 4. John mentions that Satan entered into Jesus again at the time of the Last Supper. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. John chapter 13 verse 27 Verse 4 And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard, and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Officers of the temple guard were leaders of the temple police and were Jews, not Romans. This is confirmed in verse 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? In Acts chapter 4 verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And in Acts chapter 5 verse 24. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. How he might betray Jesus. Judas planned that Jesus would be seized apart from the crowd. As confirmed in verse 53, Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. The Jewish authorities had issued orders seeking the inconspicuous arrest of Jesus. But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. John chapter 11 verse 57 Judas Iscariot could help them because he was one of the twelve and would be able to tell them where Jesus could be found, thus fulfilling Psalm 41 verse 9. Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me, which he would do when there were no crowds present. Judas is to identify Jesus to his opponents by night. Without modern lighting systems, finding and identifying someone at night would be a difficult task. Mark, like Luke, is more general in his report than Matthew, and simply says Judas was given money in exchange for betraying Jesus. But Matthew records the exact amount, 30 silver coins. Matthew chapter 26 verse 15b. In the Old Testament, this was the price of a slave accidentally gored to death by an ox, recorded in Exodus 21 verse 32, and was equivalent to about four months' wages. 
It also fulfilled the prophecy given about 500 years before Jesus' time on earth. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11 verse 12. New subsection. Luke chapter 22 verses 7 to 38. The Last Supper. As with the donkey's colt in Luke chapter 19 verse 30, Jesus' poor knowledge of the man carrying the water and the upper room bear testimony to his divinity. He could just as easily have given directions to Peter and John to the house where he would celebrate the Passover. But by choosing this more obscure option, Jesus helped them to trust and obey his instructions. New Subheading Luke chapter 22 verses 7 to 13 Preparations for us to eat the Passover as the time for the Feast of Passover approaches, Jesus gives precise instructions to two of his disciples as to how they will find the right location for Jesus to share his Last Supper with them. Verse 7 Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asked, Where is the guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. As in Mark chapter 14 verses 12 to 16, the Passover account follows the plot against Jesus. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters. The teacher asked, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. Day of Unleavened Bread refers to either Nisan 14 or Nisan 15, but here it is Thursday Nisan 14. The confusion arises over the fact that the preparation is normally undertaken during the daytime, which is Nisan 14, but can be undertaken after twilight the same day, which is then Nisan 15 on the Jewish calendar. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. Leviticus 23 verses 5 to 6. On which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. It was customary to sacrifice the lamb before sundown, usually at the ninth hour, 1500, on Nisan 14, which happened for Jesus' group but it was legally correct to be killed after sundown, and therefore on Nisan 15. Speaking of the lambs or the kids that were to be kept for the meal, God instructed Moses that they were to be brought into the house on the 10th of the month, and then to take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Exodus 12 verse 6 Jesus died at approximately the ninth hour as our sacrificial lamb. The Passover meal had to be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. You must not sacrifice the Passover in any town the Lord your God gives you, except in the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. There you must sacrifice the Passover in the evening, when the sun goes down, on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. Deuteronomy 16 verses 5 to 6 Go and make preparations involved having the lamb sacrificed at the temple, roasting it, preparing the room for the meal, and preparing various side dishes. The disciples would be met by a man recognised by his carrying a jar of water, something one would expect a woman to be doing. The man would be looking for them and would lead them to a place for their Passover meal. The secretive nature of the meeting suggests that Jesus was seeking privacy. Everything takes place just as Jesus had told them, as we saw with the donkey's colt in Luke chapter 19 verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them, suggesting either a pre-arrangement or more likely a miraculous work of God. New Subheading Luke chapter 22 verses 14 to 23 The Passover meal and the institution of the Lord's Supper Luke's version of Jesus' final Passover meal with his disciples differs in two ways from Matthew and Mark. He places Jesus' statement about his betrayal after the meal, rather than before probably an arrangement by topic. 
and refers to two cups, verses 17 to 18 and verse 20, rather than one. Verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at table. When the hour came indicates the hour to celebrate the Passover, verse 15, and in a broader sense the hour of Jesus' suffering and death. John 13 verse 1 confirms this. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own, who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. As does John 17 verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. They reclined at table. The Passover was eaten in a reclining position, as were other festive meals, confirmed in these words. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. Luke chapter 11 verse 37. As mentioned previously, in formal dining, guests reclined on a couch that stretched around three sides of a room. The host took the centre seat at a U-shaped series of low tables, surrounded by the most honoured guests on either side, with the guests' heads reclining towards the tables and their feet toward the wall. Verse 15 And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus eagerly desired to eat this meal with his disciples for several reasons. 1. It represented the founding of the nation of Israel. After sunset, with the beginning of Nisan 15, the Passover meal begins. The celebrants remember the beginning of Israel's deliverance from slavery, when the Lord brought judgment by killing the firstborn of every Egyptian house, but passed over the Israelite houses, where the blood of the Passover lamb had been applied. See Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 to 28. Those who celebrate the Passover also look forward to the ultimate liberation. Because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt, on this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honour the Lord for the generations to come. Exodus chapter 12 verse 42 From now on, Jesus' blood will protect, from judgment, those who take refuge in him. Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 2. Jesus himself was now about to become the true Passover lamb, who would be sacrificed for the sins of the people, and thus, this Passover meal was the last in long centuries of celebrating it, while looking forward to the Messiah. 3. Jesus knew the meal would richly symbolise the giving of his body and blood for the disciples to earn salvation for them. 4. The Passover meal itself looked forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. Those invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb are believers who belong to his beloved bride, the Church, those who have been called through the Gospel of Grace. On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death for ever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Isaiah chapter 25 verses 6 to 9. See also Luke chapter 14 verses 15 to 24. The marriage supper of the Lamb was anticipated in the predictions of the Messianic banquet in Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 to 14. Personal comment. He eagerly desired to share supper and we should eagerly desire to be partakers in the same way and with a thankful heart. Verse 16. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. I will not eat it implies I will not eat it again and some manuscripts make this more explicit. Until it finds fulfilment refers to the future messianic banquet in heaven as noted in verse 15. Verse 17 After taking the cup he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. Taking the cup is most likely the third of four cups of the Passover. The cup of blessing or the cup of redemption that corresponds to God's third promise in Exodus chapter 6 verse 6b. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. He gave thanks as the Greek word Eucharistio, from which comes Eucharist. Jesus always thanks the Father for everything that has been given to him, and we should do likewise. 
Verse 18. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took bread, just as he did when feeding the five thousand. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. John chapter 6 verse 11. The expression, this is my body, has been subject to widely varying interpretations throughout the history of the church. Roman Catholics understand it literally, and claim that the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ. Lutherans hold that the literal body and blood of Christ are present in, with, and under the bread and wine, in the same way water is present in a sponge. Some Anglicans refer to the real presence of Christ in the bread and wine. Most other believers have argued that the body and blood of Christ are not literally, physically, or really present, but that Christ is present symbolically. Most would also add that Christ is present spiritually with and in the believing recipients of the bread and wine, strengthening their faith and fellowship in Him, and thereby feeding their souls. Christ's spiritual presence can be supported in Matthew chapter 18 verse 20, For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. And Matthew 28 verse 20b, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Given for you is Greek word didomai, to give, and is used with respect to sacrifice in Mark chapter 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Luke chapter 2 verse 24, And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. And in Galatians 1 verse 4, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. The Greek construction translated for you often has a vicarious sense, where one person does something in place of someone else. In this case, Jesus would be the substitutionary atonement for all mankind. As represented and predicted in this celebration of the Lord's Supper, Jesus' body will be the once and for all fulfilment of the ceremonies surrounding the Passover lamb, as he will become the sacrificial atonement on the basis of which God will pass over the sins of the people. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering the significance of Jesus' death is an important component of observing the Lord's Supper, and of obedience, do this, to Christ's command. Evangelical Protestant Christians have consistently been united on the importance of limiting participation in the Lord's Supper to those who have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus. Jesus' emphasis on remembering the significance of his death when observing the Lord's Supper and his warning to those who partake of the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner both reveal the wisdom of this limitation. Verse 20 In the same way, after the supper he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This cup foreshadows the shedding of Jesus' blood and the absorbing of God's wrath, which opens the way for the redemption of all peoples through the new covenant relationship with God, which was promised to the people of Israel. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 And No longer will a man teach his neighbour, or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. Jeremiah 31 verse 34 This cup is also a metaphor for Jesus' future suffering. Consider this verse. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Matthew chapter 20 verses 22 to 23 and virtually repeated in Mark chapter 10 verses 38 to 39. It is clear from the Old Testament that the taking of the cup denotes that Jesus took upon himself the wrath of God so that he died for the sake of and instead of his people. This is confirmed in Isaiah chapter 51 verse 17. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You who have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. In Isaiah 51 verse 22, This is what your sovereign Lord says, your God, who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. In Jeremiah 25 verse 15, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup, filled with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it.
in Jeremiah 25 verse 17. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it. In Jeremiah 25 verse 28. But if they refuse to take the cup from your hand and drink, tell them, this is what the Lord Almighty says, you must drink it. In Jeremiah 49 verse 12. This is what the Lord says, for those who do not deserve to drink the cup must drink it. Why should you go unpunished? You will not go unpunished, but must drink it. In Lamentations 4 verse 21. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who live in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup will be passed. You will be drunk and stripped naked. In Ezekiel 23 verses 31 to 33. You have gone the way of your sister, so I will put her cup into your hand. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You will drink your sister's cup, a cup large and deep. It will bring scorn and derision, for it holds so much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of ruin and desolation the cup of your sister Samaria. In Habakkuk 2 verse 16 You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you and disgrace will cover your glory. And in Zechariah 12 verse 2 I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. The cup is a metaphor for the wrath of God which would pour out on sinners in righteous judgment. Since Jesus satisfies God's wrath by becoming a propitiation for sin, the continued passing of the cup to the disciples, you will drink the cup I drink, Mark chapter 10 verse 39, turns judgment on Jesus into purification for them. The cup given to Jesus is from the Father and hence Jesus is prepared to drink it. Some scholars have argued that the word propitiation should be translated expiation, i.e the wiping away of sin, but the word cannot be restricted to wiping away of sins as it also refers to the satisfaction or appeasement of God's wrath, turning it to favour. God's righteous anger needed to be appeased before sin could be forgiven, and God, in his mercy and his love for the whole human race, sent his Son who offered himself willingly to satisfy God's holy anger against all our sin. You covenant in my blood. The blood of the covenant was originally from Exodus chapter 24 verse 8. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you, in accordance with all these words. And Leviticus 17 verse 11 states, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. This indicates that Jesus' blood is sacrificial blood, thus sealing a new covenant. It was poured out in death. For you is confirmed in verse 19 and makes explicit the for many of Mark chapter 14 verse 24. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Paul appears to have received an account of this meal by divine revelation. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 26 Verse 21 But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The hand of him who is going to betray me The height of disloyalty and betrayal is sharing a meal with a friend before turning on him. Much of Luke's account of the Last Supper discourse does not appear in the accounts of the Last Supper in Matthew chapter 26 verses 17 to 30 and Mark chapter 14 verses 12 to 26, but John chapters 13 to 18 expands on it and gives much more insight to the rest of the evening and early morning before the crucifixion. Verse 22 The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. The coming events for the Son of Man have been decreed by God. However, but woe to that man who betrays him, refutes all attempts to justify Judas' action. Despite the fact that the scriptures had predicted the Messiah would suffer a substitutionary death, Judas is still responsible for his evil deed. It seems all the more deceitful to do so having shared a meal with his master, who had given him such a great opportunity to repent of his sins and to turn to God, thus receiving eternal salvation for his soul. 
This is one of many scriptures that simultaneously affirm God's sovereign ordering of events, undertaken with God's foreknowledge and according to his will, but which retain an element of human responsibility. That is, although something will happen, individuals can choose to participate in a way that will ensure that it is not their actions that has made it happen. Verse 23. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Who would do this? Judas is still present and his outward behaviour, like his previous conduct, apparently did not give him away. Judas' outward behaviour conformed so nearly to that of the other disciples that they did not immediately assume that Jesus was talking about Judas. New subheading. Luke chapter 22 verses 24 to 30. Who is the greatest? The disciples had just gone through a period of humility, questioning whether they were the one to betray their Lord. Now they start to strive in personal pride as to which of them would be the greatest. What a self-contradiction is the deceitful heart of man. It is far more honourable to do good in the name of Jesus than to look great. Jesus takes the opportunity raised by a dispute of the disciples to teach them about greatness. Just as membership of the kingdom of God is the opposite to what humans might imagine, so too greatness in the kingdom is also the opposite. Verse 26 Verse 24 Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be considered to be greatest. Greatest In conjunction with the messianic expectation of a political liberator, the disciples' dream of status, honour and power perhaps recalls the Maccabean revolt of 166 to 160 BC. This is confirmed in Mark chapter 8 verses 34 to 38. Ironically, by spreading the gospel and, for all but one being martyred doing so, their work brought universal greatness to them all, and, most important of all, a place in their father's eternal home. Verse 25 Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Instead, the greatest among you, that is, church leaders and people in positions of status or power, be like the youngest, i.e., those who possess the least claim to rule others. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The disciples misunderstand greatness in terms of human endeavour, accomplishment and status. Jesus had demonstrated his own servanthood by washing their feet, which is recorded in John chapter 13 verses 1 to 17. Jesus had previously told them that they should approach the kingdom with the simplistic faith of a small child. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Mark chapter 10 verse 15. The humility of a child consists of childlike trust, vulnerability and the inability to advance his or her own cause apart from the help, direction and resources of a parent or guardian. Verse 27 For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. But I, God's standards are diametrically opposite to the world's and Jesus is the supreme example of humility. He is the one who serves, as confirmed in Luke chapter 12, verse 37. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. See also John chapter 13, verses 3 to 17. Leadership among God's people should be characterised by serving the people and acting in their best interests, not by assuming that the people are there to serve the leaders. These principles apply not only to leadership in the church, but also to all relationships, e.g. in civil government the civil authority is to be God's servant to do you good, Romans chapter 13 verse 4b. The messianic rule of God is inaugurated by the greatest example of service, Jesus' death as a substitutionary atonement, a ransom for many offered by their future ruler. This quality of humility and love for others, flowing from the infinite love of God for his people, will also characterise Christ's eternal rule. The ransom of Christ's life was paid to God the Father, who accepted it as just payment for the sins of many, i.e. all who would be saved. Verse 28 You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me. Despite their weaknesses and failings, Jesus praises his disciples, for they were those who have stood by me and shown perseverance throughout his trials. Conferring you a kingdom. 
The Son of Man upon his throne recalls the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14, in which the Ancient of Days bestows the kingdom upon one like a Son of Man. Verse 30 So that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. For eat and drink in the kingdom of God we have in Luke chapter 13 verse 29. People will come from east and west and north and south, and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. And in Luke chapter 14 verse 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus claimed that the messianic banquet is my table, and that the kingdom of God is my kingdom, would be seen as audacious if it were not true. The twelve disciples would sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes, although Judas would later be replaced by Matthias, as recorded in Acts chapter 1 verse 26. New subheading, Luke chapter 22 verses 31 to 34. Jesus foretells Peter's denial. Whereas in verse 3, Satan's increased activity centers on Judas' betrayal, now it centers on the denial of Peter and the disciples. Satan will seize any and every opportunity to disrupt the work of the kingdom and the church of Christ. Every disciple must be aware of this at all times. Verse 31 Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Simon, Simon, the use of Peter's pre-Christian name forebodes his denial. It was Jesus who had named him Peter, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. John chapter 1 verse 42 Satan has asked or demanded to have you, as confirmed in Job chapters 1 and 2, that he might sift you as wheat. You is plural in these two instances, indicating that all the disciples are in view, not just Peter. In other words, Satan is seeking to shake you all violently as one does wheat to cause you to fall. We see this in Amos 9 verse 9. For I will give the command, and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations, as grain is shaken in a sieve, and not a pebble will reach the ground. In Peter's case, the shaking was to be his panic-prompted, thrice-repeated denial that he even knew Jesus. Verse 32 But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. I have prayed that your faith may not fail. Your here is singular, so Peter alone is addressed. It is interesting that Jesus would pray for this and not simply command it. Again, it shows the total interdependence that exists within the Trinitarian Godhead. Not fail must mean not fail completely. Peter's subsequently restored faith was not his own accomplishment, but a result of the Holy Spirit's work in response to Jesus' prayer for him. The Greek for turned can mean turn around, go back or return, and is often used in context of repenting or turning back to God, as in Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In Acts chapter 9 verse 35, All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. And in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 16, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Strengthen your brothers. We will soon read of Peter's dramatic and apparent fall from grace as he denies even knowing his Lord and Master. Jesus does not view it this way, but has in mind an opportunity to strengthen Peter in his discipleship. The experience will help him to go on to be a great leader and teacher of his brothers. We see this later confirmed after Jesus' death and resurrection. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourselves and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you, and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. John chapter 21 verses 15 to 19 
Peter followed Jesus to his own destiny on the cross in Rome, strengthening his brothers and sisters, not just in his own generation, but encouraging the shaping of disciples' lives for many generations to come. Verse 33 But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Cock or rooster crows Each morning cockles crow a number of times, separated by a few minutes. In Luke, Jesus simply states before the cock crows. However, in Mark chapter 14 verse 30, he specifies the first two individual crowings, confirmed again in verse 72. Matthew and John refer to the entire time of several crowings. The key point is not the cock, but Peter's denial. Deny three times is confirmed in verses 54 to 62. The number three is often used in the scriptures to indicate completeness or finality. Although Peter fell, he was not cast down, but with grace, repentance and faith he was restored to become a great teacher and leader in the faith. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Psalm 51 verses 11 to 13 New subheading, Luke chapter 22 verses 35 to 38, Scripture must be fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus prepares the disciples for their post-resurrection mission. This is similar to the account given to his disciples after his resurrection. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what the Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Luke chapter 24 verses 45 to 49. And just before the ascension, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Verse 35. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without a purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus sent his disciples out without purse, bag or sandals, as we saw in Luke chapter 9 verse 3 and Luke chapter 10 verse 4. Now, however, they will need extra provisions and supplies, but we see that Jesus will never send out his disciples without properly equipping them first. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Many interpreters take this to be a metaphorical statement, commanding the disciples to be armed spiritually to fight spiritual foes, which Paul refers to as putting on the armour of God in Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 17. In favour of this view, 1. In verse 38, the disciples misunderstand Jesus' command and produce literal swords. On this view, Jesus' response that it is enough is a rebuke, saying essentially, enough of this talk about swords. 2. Later on, Jesus will again prohibit the use of a literal sword, verses 49-51. This is confirmed in Matthew chapter 26, verses 51-52. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And in John chapter 18 verses 10 to 11, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Others take this as a command to have a literal sword for self-defense and protection from robbers. In support of this view, a. The money bag, knapsack and cloak in the same verse are literal, and so the sword must be taken literally as well. b. Jesus' response that it is enough, verse 38, actually approves the swords the disciples have as being enough, and Jesus' later rebuke in verses 49-51 to 51 only prohibits them from blocking his arrest and suffering as written in John chapter 18 verse 11 above, that is, from seeking to advance the kingdom of God by force. c. The very fact that the disciples possessed swords, verse 38, 
suggests that Jesus has not prohibited them from carrying swords up to this point. Again, this view is supported in John chapter 18, verses 10 to 11. And Jesus never prohibited self-defense. We have a similar account in Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Where Jesus focuses on individual conduct that shows he is prohibiting the universal human tendency to seek personal revenge. Both views have some merit. Peter, who gets to use his sword in verse 50 and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant called Malchus, John chapter 18 verse 10, later sees this as an issue of mindset rather than an actual sword. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who suffered in his body is done with sin. 1 Peter 4 verse 1 Of course, Jesus' sword was the word of God. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Revelation 19 verse 15 Verse 37 It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfilment. What is written or scripture must be fulfilled. Jesus' impending suffering and death are a divine necessity. God's providential plan must be fulfilled. He was numbered with the transgressors. This is from Isaiah 53 verse 12 and was fulfilled at his crucifixion. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Luke chapter 23 verses 32 to 33. And one of the criminals who hung there held insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 23 verses 39 to 43. Verse 38. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. For Lord, here are two swords. See verses 35 to 36 and the associated comments on swords. New section. Luke chapter 22 verse 39 to Luke chapter 23 verse 56. The arrest and trial. This second part of the Passion narrative recounts the events surrounding the trial and execution of Jesus. New subsection. Luke chapter 22 verses 39 to 46. Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. The second part of the account of Christ's suffering and death opens with a change of scene. Verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. Went out as usual. This had been Jesus' normal routine for the past week. Each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. Luke chapter 21 verse 37. The Passover evening had to be spent in Greater Jerusalem, as confirmed earlier in Deuteronomy 16 verses 1 to 7, which included the Mount of Olives. As previously noted, the Mount of Olives or Olivet, with its spectacular view of the Temple Mount, stands just east of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley. Jesus and his disciples regularly crossed over Olivet on their way from Jerusalem through Bethphage to Bethany, which lay on the mountain's eastern slope. The traditional site of Gethsemane lies on Olivet's western slope. Verse 40 On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. By writing on reaching the place, Luke is assuming his readers knew that the place was the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means oil press, indicating a garden area among the olive groves on the Mount of Olives, where olive oil was prepared. The traditional location of Gethsemane is now marked by the modern Church of All Nations, which was built over a 4th century Byzantine church. There is an image of the Church of All Nations. There is an image of the Garden of Gethsemane, as it is today. Pray that you will not fall into temptation. The temptation was to succumb to physical sleep. See verses 45 to 46, 
partly due to their emotional experience and partly due to the wine consumed at the supper and thus fail in their responsibility to support Jesus. It may point also to the temptation to deny Jesus when he is led away to the cross, which will be confirmed in verses 54 to 62. The sixth and final petition of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 13, addresses the disciples' battle with sin and evil. The word translated temptation can indicate either temptation or testing. The meaning there most likely carries the sense, allow us to be spared from difficult circumstances that would tempt us to sin. Although God never directly tempts believers, he does sometimes lead them into situations that test them. In fact, trials and hardships will inevitably come into believers' lives, and believers should consider it pure joy, James chapter 1 verse 2b, when trials come, for they are strengthened by them. Nevertheless, believers should never pray to be brought into such situations, but should pray to be delivered from them, for hardship and temptation make obedience more difficult and will sometimes result in sin. Believers should pray to be delivered from temptation and led in paths of righteousness in accordance with Psalm 23 verse 3b. Verse 41 He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw, which was enough to be alone but close enough for the disciples to overhear him praying. Knelt down Matthew chapter 26 verse 39 records it as fell with his face to the ground. In this typical posture of abject humility in prayer, Jesus lays his life before his Father in complete honesty and surrender. Jesus is facing the most severe temptation of his earthly life at the moment when he is ready to accomplish the culmination of that life's mission, that is, to bear the sins of the world, which is what this cup signifies. Verse 42 Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. As discussed previously, Father was Abba in Aramaic, and although it was used as a term of familiarity towards one's father, it was also a word that shows great respect. This cup is a metaphor for Jesus' future suffering, as confirmed in Matthew chapter 20 verses 22 to 23. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. And the almost identical passage in Mark chapter 10 verses 38 to 39. It is clear from the Old Testament that the taking of the cup denotes that Jesus took upon himself the wrath of God, as previously discussed, so that he died for the sake of and instead of his people. Yet not my will but yours be done. Jesus consciously, voluntarily and obediently endured the cross, despising its shame. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 Personal comment In my opinion, this is something all followers of Jesus should be continually saying. Whether on his knees or prostrate on the ground, Jesus was at one with the Father, submitting his human will to that of God and accepting the task of redeeming mankind. Verse 43 An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Due to his human frailties, Jesus needed the assistance of an angel who strengthened him in this time of extreme testing. At this time he was perhaps a little lower than the angels. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 7 and 2 verse 9. Even though he was not delivered from his sufferings, he was strengthened in them through prayer. Something we too can share in as we read in these words. When I called you answered me, you made me bold and stout-hearted. Psalm 138 verse 3. My hand will sustain him, surely my arm will strengthen him. Psalm 89 verse 21. This is what the Lord says, In the time of my favour I will answer you, and in the day of salvation I will help you. I will keep you, and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. Isaiah 49 verse 8 Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Isaiah 50 verse 7 And... During the days of Jesus' life on earth, 
He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and, once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 7 to 9. Jesus was in anguish in anticipation of bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 1 Peter 2 verse 24. Therefore he prayed more earnestly. His sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Although the word like may indicate that this is to be understood metaphorically, there are both ancient and modern accounts on record of people sweating blood, a condition known as hematidrosis, where extreme anguish or physical strain causes one's capillary blood vessels to dilate and burst, mixing sweat and blood. In either case, Luke's main purpose is to highlight the intensity of Jesus' emotional and physical trauma. Sweat came in with sin. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19 And for the sinless and perfect Jesus, made sin for us, a grievous sweat came upon him, with drops like blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Verse 45 When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Asleep, exhausted from sorrow, for it had been a long day, and the disciples were emotionally and physically exhausted. They would also have consumed no small amount of wine at Passover. Sleeping for sorrow appears only in Luke, giving further insight to the stress the disciples were experiencing, having learned all that Jesus had told them that evening as recorded in John's Gospel, chapters 13 to 16. Verse 46 Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Get up and pray reminds us of what happened to Jonah. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Jonah 1 verse 6 For this is what we are called to do in times of strife and trouble. That you will not fall into temptation was commented on in verse 40. If disciples remain in constant communion with the Father, it is far less likely that they will be tempted by all the things that the world tries to offer them. New subsection. Luke chapter 22 verses 47 to 53. Jesus arrested. This section is closely tied to the preceding narrative by while he was still speaking, in verse 47. It happens in the early hours so that there will be no witnesses or the usual crowds that surrounded Jesus and who would probably have tried to protect him. This is probably as much ordained by God as it was the Jewish leaders. Verse 47 While he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Usually the crowd is positive towards Jesus, but this is not an ordinary crowd, as we will see in verse 52. Luke emphasizes Judas' treachery by referring to him as one of the twelve. The great crowd possibly consisted of a detachment of Roman soldiers, assigned by Pilate to the temple for security, as they were openly carrying swords. They were accompanied by the Levitical temple police and the personal security guards of the chief priests and Sanhedrin elders, who were carrying clubs. Judas led them to Jesus and gave him a kiss. This badge of love and friendship had become the instrument of treachery. Whereas it was customary for a disciple to greet his teacher with a kiss, here it serves as a means of betrayal to identify Jesus in the darkness. Mark chapter 14 verse 44 states, Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Verse 49 when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this, and he touched the man's ear and healed him. Although at a word from Jesus the mob fell to the ground, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. John chapter 18 verse 6 which showed he had the power to overcome this group, yet he removes the heat from the situation and heals the wounded man, submitting quietly to the mob. 
This was a sign of his love for his enemies, and these were, no doubt, included in his prayer on the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke chapter 23, verse 34a. What was going to happen? Jesus' arrest. This would be followed by significant physical and psychological abuse, a rigged trial and his crucifixion. Should we strike with the sword? As already discussed, swords were commonly worn for protection against thieves. Cutting off his right ear. Peter's sword was likely the Roman short sword called a gladius that could be hidden under a person's garment, as confirmed in verse 38. With regard to cutting off his ear, the short sword was for stabbing, not slicing. Thus it is considered a possibility that Peter intended to kill the man with a lethal blow to the head, but the servant was able to evade the blow, suffering only the loss of his ear. Malchus was the man's name, which is recorded only in John's Gospel. However, the name Malchus is known in Josephus from an earlier period, and in the Baton and Palmyrene inscriptions. These occurrences make it likely that it was Arabic, a common race of the servants in Jerusalem at that time. That Jesus touched and healed him is recorded only in Luke, but is in keeping with the compassion that Jesus had consistently shown throughout his ministry. Verse 52 Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? The chief priests as previously stated several times, are not the high priest, but members of the senior priestly family, and were probably Sadducees. For officers of the temple guard, see comments on verses 4 to 6. Elders were the local Jewish officials. In Jerusalem, they were probably part of the Sanhedrin. Am I leading a rebellion? Although Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors, in accordance with Isaiah 53 verse 12, and was being treated as an insurrectionist, his conduct while in public, clearly contradicted their inappropriate treatment of him. He goes on to charge them with this. Personal comment. Jesus was, of course, the greatest revolutionary in history. Verse 53. Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Every day I was with you in the temple courts. The fact that Jesus taught openly in the temple, whereas revolutionaries would have operated clandestinely, shows that he is not a revolutionary in the sense they were meaning. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Such men prefer to work after dark because, as John records, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. John chapter 3 verse 19 And as Jesus had apparently instructed Paul, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Acts chapter 26 verses 17 to 18 Let this quiet us under prevalence of the church's enemies. Let it quiet us in the dying hour, for we know that 1. It is but an hour that is permitted for the triumph of our adversary. A brief time, a limited time only. 2. It is their hour, which is appointed for them by God, and in which they are permitted to test their strength, that omnipotence may be glorified all the more in their fall. 3. It is the power of darkness that rides master, and darkness must submit to light, and the power of darkness be made to submit in obedience to the light of the world. John chapter 8 verse 12. Christ was willing to wait for his victories until all was accomplished, and we must be willing to wait too. New subsection. Luke chapter 22 verses 54 to 62. Peter disowns Jesus. Luke places Peter's denial of Jesus before Jesus' appearance before the Sanhedrin, verses 66 to 71, while Matthew and Mark place it afterward. Luke may have wanted to arrange his material in a more topical, orderly way. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Luke chapter 1 verse 3. Verse 54. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. The house of the high priest would have been the home of Caiaphas. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. 
Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. The ruling high priest's residence was perhaps shared with his father-in-law, Annas. Before Jesus can be brought to the Roman governor, charges must be confirmed by the official high priest Caiaphas, who presided over the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas managed to retain control of the high priesthood for nearly 18 years, circa AD 18 to 36, longer than anyone else in the first century. Josephus, Jewish Antiquities 18, verse 35 and verse 95. He was certainly the high priest during Jesus' ministry, although he also consulted frequently with his father-in-law, Annas. There is an image of the house of the high priests. There is an image of St. Peter of the Cockrow Church. Josephus' depiction of the high priestly house in the upper city of Jerusalem, overlooking the temple area, Jewish War 2, verse 426, has suggested to some scholars the possibility of identifying Caiaphas' house with some residents amid the wealthy Roman-era houses excavated atop Mount Zion. Others contend for a traditional site of Caiaphas' house beneath St. Peter of the Cockrow Church toward the base of Mount Zion. The sketch shows the traditional route of Jesus on his last night. Jewish sources report that he was kept in an underground dungeon, probably a dry drain into which he would be lowered on a rope for much of the night. It would have been cold and pitch black inside. An archaeological find in 1990 raised the possibility that an elaborately decorated ossuary, or a box for reburying the bones of the dead, which has the name Joseph Caiaphas crudely etched on its side, once contained Caiaphas' bones. This ossuary was found in a relatively modest tomb complex south of Jerusalem. See the image. Peter followed at a distance to see the outcome, according to Matthew 26, verse 58b. John was with him. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. John chapter 18, verses 15 to 16. Verse 55. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. Sat down with them. Peter demonstrates courage by his presence in a hostile environment, but his courage fails him. I don't know him, when his own safety is threatened. Verse 58. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. The people in the courtyard know that Peter is a Galilean by his accent, which is confirmed in Matthew chapter 26, verse 73. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Jesus' disciples, with the exception of Judas, were from Galilee, and Judeans in Jerusalem looked down on Galileans, and not just because of their regional pronunciations. Verse 60. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the cock crowed. Upon Peter's third denial, the cock crowed. See verse 34 and comments made there. Verse 61. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the cock crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. It is not known whether Jesus and Peter were in the same place, or if Jesus had a room overlooking the courtyard. Or more likely, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter is a symbolic act. It could mean many things. Anger, resentment, disappointment, and I told you so look pity or sorrow, but most likely it was done with grace, love and forgiveness. This was probably one of the key turning points in Peter's ministry. Personal comment. It is easy for us to be critical of this action and many others by Peter. How could he deny his Saviour after three years of faithful service, the teaching he received and the miracles he witnessed? Let us not forget that Jesus prophesied Peter's martyrdom, and yet Peter continues to serve Jesus for his remaining life and subsequent death by crucifixion in Rome. He would have endured many other hardships on his way to his own death as well. New Subsection 
Luke chapter 22 verses 63 to 65. The guards mocked Jesus. Before his trial, Jesus was mocked and beaten, just as he had predicted in Luke chapter 9 verse 22. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. In Luke chapter 17 verse 25, But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And in Luke chapter 18 verses 32 to 33, He will be turned over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. Verse 63, The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. The men who were guarding Jesus were probably officers, see verse 4 and verse 52, that is, leaders of the temple police, rather than actual members of the Sanhedrin. Verse 64, They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? Blindfolded him, prophesy. Jesus is challenged to prove that he is a prophet by identifying who hit him, a despicable and silly game that Jesus chose to ignore and endure the pain instead. Verse 65, And they said many other insulting things to him. Insulting things to him. Whereas Jesus is accused of blasphemy, as in Matthew chapter 26 verse 65, then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. It is interesting that, by reacting this way, it was the high priest who was the one who is guilty of breaking the law, with a capital offence in God's eyes. For it is written, Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. Leviticus 10 verse 6a And the high priest, the one among his brothers who has had the anointing oil poured on his head and who has been ordained to wear the priestly garments, must not let his hair become unkempt or tear his clothes. Leviticus 21 verse 10 Continuing with the blasphemy allegations, in Mark chapter 14 verse 64 we read, You have heard the blasphemy, what do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. And in John chapter 10 verse 33, We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. But it is Jesus who is really the object and victim of blasphemous words and acts. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Luke chapter 23 verse 39. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. John chapter 19 verses 2 to 3 New subsection Luke chapter 22 verses 66 to 71 Jesus before the council Luke's account of Jesus' trial is considerably shorter than Matthew's and Mark's. It is likely that it was held in two sessions, one during the night and one at daybreak. Verse 66 At daybreak the council of the elders of the people both the chief priests and teachers of the law met together, and Jesus was led before them. At daybreak indicates that Luke combines the first, Mark chapter 14 verses 53 to 65, and the second, Mark chapter 15 verse 1, meetings of the Sanhedrin. This is also interesting because, under Jewish law at the time, it was not legal to hold a trial during the hours of darkness. This had all the hallmarks of a kangaroo court. Council of the Elders is a synonym for the Sanhedrin, which we will see confirmed by Paul's words in Acts chapter 22 verse 5, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. The whole council or Sanhedrin need not denote all 70 members, but may just indicate those hastily assembled in the middle of the night, as 23 members made a quorum. Sanhedrin could refer either to a local Jewish tribunal, e.g. council, courts, or, as here, to the Supreme Ecclesiastical Court or Council of the Jews that was centred in Jerusalem. The Romans were ultimately in control of all judicial proceedings, but allowed their subjects some freedom to try their own cases. The chief priests and teachers of the law described the makeup of the Sanhedrin. Verse 67 If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me. 
and if I asked you, you would not answer. If you are the Christ, tell us. This was the key issue of the trial. Jesus answers with a qualified yes. He had told them before, but they would not believe him. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. John chapter 6 verse 36 If I tell you, if I ask you, Jesus knows that it would be futile to enter into dialogue with those whose minds are already made up. Mark's Gospel, which almost certainly was highly influenced by Peter, shows that Jesus did at some point give an affirmative answer. I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Mark chapter 14 verse 62 In acknowledging he was the Messiah, the very one that the others in the room were expecting and hoping would come, Jesus provides them with a clear opportunity of having an impartial hearing to look at all the overwhelming evidence to back up his claims. Again, under Jewish law, this was something Jesus would have been entitled to. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? John chapter 7, verses 50 to 51. Instead, their hearts were hardened, their eyes were blind, their ears were deaf, and their minds were made up to rid themselves of this thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, who threatened their prominent positions and affluent lifestyles. Verse 69. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the Mighty God. The Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the Mighty God. The crucifixion of Jesus is not the end, but his exodus or departure, as noted on the Mount of Transfiguration. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfilment at Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9 verse 31b, leading to glory. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Luke chapter 24 verse 26. And the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Acts chapter 3 verse 13a. Jesus declares that he is not only the human Messiah, anticipated by the Jews, but also the divine Son of Man, as described in Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14a. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. It is he who sits at the right hand of God in Psalm 110 verse 1, and who will come in power to reign over the earth. Verse 70 They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You are right in saying I am. The Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah and Son of Man all refers to Jesus emphasizing different aspects of his person and role. Son of God points to Jesus' unique relationship to God, when rightly understood to his equality with God the Father in his very being. The terms Christ indicates that Jesus claimed to be the Son of David, i.e. the Messiah. Son of Man points to the person identified in Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14, who will rule the kingdom of God. You are writing saying I am, or you say that I am. A Greek expression that deflects responsibility back on the one asking the question, as in Matthew chapter 26 verse 25. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. And in Matthew chapter 26 verse 64. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Saying, I am. This would have been a significant statement by Jesus. God had called himself, I am. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 to 14. Jesus had aligned himself with this before when speaking to the Jews in the temple courts. You are not yet fifty years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. 
John chapter 8 verses 57 to 59. Verse 71. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Although they consider this to be proof of his guilt, it was only fulfilling the predetermined mindset they had from the beginning. Why do we need any more testimony? Or what further testimony do we need? The desire to catch Jesus in something he might say, e.g., waiting to catch him in something he might say, Luke chapter 11 verse 54, has been achieved, or so they believe. We have heard it from his own lips indicates that the members of the Sanhedrin considered Jesus' Christological claims, verses 68 to 70, to be sufficient justification for condemning him. But we know that what he says is true. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, John chapter 3 verse 5a. And more than that, it was one of his primary purposes for coming to this world in the first place, as he explains to Pilate. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. John chapter 18 verse 37b Luke chapter 22 ends 